Taxation is theft. Please, at least leave us alone in our living room. My job is to find the truth. Double the taxes. I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. Triple the taxes. This is an IRS agent's dream. If you think that the Capitol will ever treat us fairly, you are lying to yourself. Beautiful, lovely taxes. Uh -oh. Sorry, but I don't do taxes. Did you see the memo about this? The government is a greedy piglet. Just leave us alone. Do you know what Ralph just said? The roads. <laughs> you boys like Mexico! I'm as bad as hell, and I'm not gonna take this anymore! And welcome back. Taxation is theft. There's a guy, um, you might have heard, uh, he's running for vice president. His name is Spike. I don't know. Is that his? Do you think that's his real name? That sounds like a pseudonym to me. Well, he's going to be joining us today. But uh, before we get started, before I allow him to speak, before I unmute him, because um, I have that kind of control over over the vice president. Remember that if he gets elected and if he's in the White House, I have that control to shut him up. Before I oh, before wow. I unshut him up. Oh, I didn't really. He's just he's just not saying anything because I haven't said oh. him yet. <laughs> See, yeah, he's damn. I, I don't even have that power. Shit. Before I release the beast, share this video, start a watch party, uh, do whatever you can because this is going to be an awesome show. Because I I think we're going to announce our involvement in a conspiracy theory. Yes. A, Jew a Jewish conspiracy theory. Oh yeah. Oh, the anti the best kind. The best go kind. Wild. It's gonna be nuts. It's gonna be nuts. So share it. Share it so that you're in your group of friends. You're the guy that was like, "Holy shit, he was right the whole time," and he was the guy who knew. You're gonna be that. You're gonna be that local celebrity. Oh man. Because you were the first to share this video. Be the one who shared the threat, the Jewish threat, before anyone else. <laughs> So Spike, oh. Shalom, how's it going? Shalom, how are you doing? Happy, happy early Shabbat Shalom. Yeah, that's right. Do you? Like, uh, really, really. I feel like we had this conversation in a thread over the over the technicalities um, of whether or not you're supposed to be Amish for the weekend. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Whether you're supposed to be uh, 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 sh uh, Shabbat Amish, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so, but you celebrate, don't you? I post memes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Close enough. I, I post wholesome memes for, for the Sabbath, for, wholesome, for Shabbat. Wholesome memes. That's, that, that is my mitzvah. That is a niche. That is a it niche. It is. It's my, it's my niche mitzvah for, for Shabbat, yeah. Because so many memes are just like savage. Wholesome memes. Yeah, that's are the like... thing. They're, they're like, like lighthearted, nice memes. People will, will message me and say, you know, what's the punchline I'm missing? I'm like, no punchline. I love you. It's Shabbat. There's no punchline. Okay, so you know, because I, because you know, I'm a fucking nerd. I had to just go to wholesomememes.com. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> you found it. it. It's there. It's there. It but is it's, there. Yeah, but it's it's. I, uh, yeah, it's not. It, there's no memes. False advertising. What on wholesomememes.com? Yeah, there's it's Oh, it's, that's not where you go. You go to Reddit wholesome memes and Twitter wholesome memes. Oh, really? Yeah, that's where you go, man. Or you do what I do and well, so I'd say a, a third of them come from one of those sources, a third come from just my interactions with people sharing like wholesome stuff, and then a third I create. A third of those are are Spike Cohen No, this Spike Cohen original creations. Yeah. This one's got 15 followers. This can't be the right one. I'm gonna have to get your sources because, um, yeah, I'll, I'd, I'll send you my sources. I'd love some wholesome memes because you're also Jewish, so I would love to. I would love. I'll to send steal. you my my Shabbat stash. Did you know? See, a lot of people think that the Jews control YouTube, but there's actually a YouTube. YouTube, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's got which some... we also probably don't control, but it, there is a YouTube. <laughs> it's like a it's like a honey pot. <laughs> it's a honey it's it's part of the the alt-right pipeline is youtube right this is how Never we get them there, off of youtube <laughs> well because you can share it you can go see look the conspiracy is real i found it on youtube and it right. turns out it's run by like stormfront or something i have no idea what youtube is 
but that would be funny if that's what it is. It's no, it's just like it's just like people uploading. It's like YouTube. It's like what YouTube used to be before it was like everything before there were podcasts and, and right. unboxing video. It was like, you know, viral video type stuff. There, right, right, right. Yeah, it's a lot of that kind of stuff, but just just Jewish. Just Jewish. It's like it's like world star hip hop for Jews. For Jews. <laughs> world star hip-hop for jews so everyone like two people are suing each other and someone <laughs> records it it says world star oh, oh man God. um so you're running for vice president i am with, i am in fact running for vice president of the united states of america yeah with none other than vermin supreme vermin supreme yes does does he give you like a do you get to like ride the pony into the into the conventions and does he actually have a pony? Does he have like a prototype? He has at times access to ponies, yes. Um, and I have not ridden one yet, but we do promise to ride our ponies into a zombie-powered future. So it's it's coming. It's there. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Well, um, it's good to have you on my show again. Thank you. Because last time, I think the last time you were on my show, it was on your show. On my show. I was on your show on, but then I think, I think also then I was on your show on my show. We were actually on our respective shows talking adjacent to one another. You were the host of yours and my, the host of mine. And what's fun about that is that I didn't know that until we were live. And I said, you know, welcome Dan, Dan Berman. And you said, no, welcome to you, Spike Cohen. And I'm like, what are we doing? And then, and then I realized, and then you told me, you know, I want, you're on the show too. And so that brought a different level of pressure where it was like, not only do I have to run a show, I have to be a good guest too. Um, right. So thank you for that. Um, but I, uh, yeah, no, we, uh, the, the last time you were on and if I had been, you know, if I had thought I would have actually like streamed this live on my side too and been like, yeah, no, screw you. You're on my show now too again. So I didn't do that though. It's, it's complicated. It's like, it's almost like a paradox. It is a paradox. It is paradox, and it's Jewish on both ends, so it doesn't really. That's yeah. That's just that's just another kink in the, in the matrix. Yeah. Yeah. The Jewish matrix. Yeah. 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 Wow. All right. Well, um, man. So, uh, I, I want to ask like these these deep personal questions, but I don't even okay. know where to start. I mean, nice. like, what what? So, okay. I mean, running with vermin, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of a joke campaign. And of course, everybody wants to be in on it. That's your tagline, right? In on the joke, hashtag in, in on, on the, the joke. joke. Yeah. Um, what's? But I also know, like, you're you're a very you're a pretty serious libertarian. You've been around around this for a while with a right. good sense of humor. Um, yeah. So what's? Um, I don't know. What do you see? What do you think is? What do you think is really going to happen here? Um, because we've got. I mean, shit, we've got Amash, like, going to announce soon. Not We're told, yeah. Not going to, yeah, it's, I mean, it's as obvious as Chafee, right? Chafee, right. oh, I bought my lifetime membership, but I'm not going to run for president. Oops, right. I'm running for president. How did that happen? How, how did that happen? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, so I, I think, you know, here, here is why I got into this race because when I when I when I interviewed Vermin uh, last October on my show, um, and he was kind enough to not also be having me on his show at the same time. When uh, when I interviewed Vermin and and then I saw what his reach was on social media, where he was where he was bringing in people that like you know d didn't really have any uh, appeal in and of themselves to libertarianism, but they were they were drawn to this persona, this character. Uh, to the point where they, uh, you know, some of them were hardcore supporters of Bernie Sanders or or Yang or or you know uh, Tulsi, but they also really liked Vermin. And I saw this as a real potential opening to reach disaffected voters who were all about to get screwed really hard by their parties to give them an option to really just say fuck you to the whole thing. We're allowed right. to swear, right? What's that? Oh are yes, we, yeah, we yeah. Swear. Okay, no, I just want to make sure because I, I don't. no, <laughs> holy shit, hold on, let me uh. No swearing. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so um, here we go. Yeah. Yeah. That's see, right. that's what happens when you swear. That's what happens when you swear is the dog starts barking. Yeah. That's, that's, that's our bleep. 
I'd nice. Say. Yeah, so she's, that's, she's on a so, delay. No, I mean, this is this is our is an, an opportunity, to, basically, a no confidence vote, and and the whole thing is that we are. It's two things. One, we are giving a, a gi- an opportunity for everyone to give a giant middle finger to the system and, and to say, no, this, if you're going to give us a joke of a system that is run by clowns who do nothing but tell cynical lies and, and, and unrealistic promises to us and then turn around and harm us, we would much rather vote for an even funnier joke that has even funnier clowns who make even more outrageous promises and aren't going to hurt us. That We would much rather have that. It also is an opportunity for us to message the joke that is this entire the state and the government and the system. How much more ridiculous is it for a man to wear a, a boot on his head and tell him that tell you that you have to brush your teeth than to a, a man wearing a, a piece of metal on his chest and telling you that you have to wear a seatbelt? They're both absurd. They're both absurdities. One of which is backed up by threats and violence. And, and one of them, which isn't one of them, which is just backed up by someone having fun with it. So it, it is an opportunity for us to message a, a libertarian, uh, really an anarchist message uh, using nonlinear messaging instead of coming to people all wide eyed and yelling to them about how the government is a lie. And it's, you know, how, how all government force is illegitimate and so forth. We can do it using humor and open their eyes to it. And when they're curious as to why we're even doing what we're doing, then we can have that serious conversation with them. And that's what I've been doing with my campaign. That's what I was doing with my show even before we started the campaign, uh, is using humor to, to spread a message of self-ownership and non-aggression and, 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 and personal individual autonomy and, and, and voluntary solutions over coercive forced ones. Do you think that could backfire in any way um, where you have people um hmm like maybe supporting a message that you know they so okay you have you're you're talking about bringing people in from the left socialist camp right um like the a lot of the people who are following bernie sanders are like yeah we want we want free college we want you know free stuff Medicare and, for all and all that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then you're you're offering them free ponies as a joke, but then you're not like or or are you explaining to them at some point why free stuff is not such a great idea um, is like, are they coming over and are they do they still have this idea of, yeah, we like this guy because, you know, screw the system. But are they are they getting the joke? Are they getting the idea that, yeah, free stuff doesn't make any sense and we should stop asking for free stuff? Or are they still coming over with the idea that, well, well, yeah, we want to get this guy elected because, you know, screw everybody else. But at the same time, we still want our free college or free health care or whatever. So I think it's a combination of those things. I, th- I think some people get the joke immediately that what the, the absurdity of what we're promising that, you know, we're going to give free stuff to everyone. Uh, and then there are people who just it's just a giant F you to everyone. And, and they, they aren't even concerned about their, their, their biggest concern is to piss off both their Trump supporting relatives and their Biden supporting relatives uh, on Thanksgiving and on Christmas to tell them they voted for Vermin Supreme. Um, so it's not it doesn't even speak to a, a, a messaging thing. Or, or a political uh, messaging as much as just an opportunity for them to express dissatisfaction with the system that has largely left them behind. But what it also does, whether they get it or not, whether they're in on the, the entirety of the joke or not, if we get the buy-in of them supporting us and possibly either joining the Libertarian Party or just paying more attention to us, voting for down-ballot candidates, becoming more involved in the, the structures and the culture that we've set forward, that's our opportunity to message that greater message to them. I, I don't think that any of us has the op, has the uh, ability on a on a grand scale, maybe on individual, you know, on a retail politicking level, but on some grand scale, I don't think any of us has the the messaging ability to take a to 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 speak to, uh, for example, Bernie supporters uh, in such a way, or even Trump supporters or, or any other statist supporters in such a way that we can present something to them in a serious and almost dour tone right off the bat and get all of them to immediately support our precepts and ideas, uh, which in many times, many cases are a, a, a wild divergence from anything they've ever heard. What we can do is message them where they are uh, uh, through humor and empathy 
and then reach out to them and get them to come in and find out more about us. So, for example, I have seen people say, I don't care much about libertarianism. I don't even like libertarianism, but I'm voting for Vern- for Vermin Supreme. And other people saying, well, why would you vote for him if he's a libertarian? And them saying, well, it's making me take a second look at libertarians if they if they if Vermin Supreme considers himself one. So there's an opportunity for us to reach people. Whereas if I were to go to them and say, hey, you know what, healthcare is not a right, and uh, you know everything should be handled by the market, uh, which right now they associate the market with you know, student debt and, uh, and, and evil expensive. capitalists ripping them yeah, off. They, they, they associate the free market with a decidedly not free market system because mm-hmm. both Republicans and Democrats have incorrectly labeled this as free market capitalism. So what a great opportunity we have instead of coming to them using the precepts and the nomenclature set forward by Republicans and Democrats, instead come in in a nonlinear way, get their attention and then push them, we call it boot pilling them into libertarianism. You like vermin, then maybe you like what vermin thinks. You want to hear more about vermin thinks? Here's some information on what we think about that and get them into our ideas and our culture and our way, our our prescriptions for how a society should be structured in a voluntary way. Um, so are they all immediately going to get that? Probably not. Probably the majority of them won't, but enough of them will or at least be willing to hear more of it to get more people to libertarianism than we would have gotten otherwise. Same thing with people on the right. There are people on both the left and right who believe that they have the right to things that require violence. That's why they vote Republican and Democrat. And they're not they're not waking up and saying, well, what violence can I do to other people today uh, in order to secure the political goals that I have? They're thinking, how do I make ends meet? How do I pay my mortgage? How do I, how are we safe from people that want to hurt us? Uh, you know, how am I going to make sure I can keep my job or, or be able to keep my business going? Or how am I going to be, wh- how am I going to find a job in my um, chosen field uh, after I run up six figures of student debt and get out of college? Uh, how am I going to be able to make ends meet with this low wage job that I have and all of that stuff? So if you can reach them with humor, then there's potentially the opportunity, and, we, and we're seeing it happen in real time, for them to be open to the ideas of libertarianism using humor initially to get them in on our joke about the system. Interesting. Now, do you think there's a – there there is – because, I mean, I, I get that, right? Um, that you're – you know, it's, it's, the, it's the initial bait and hook, right, um, to, to get people in. Um, but do you think that, um, so one, as you know, this is like, what are people, what are people traditionally voting for? Right. Um, and you know, people vote for, for a million different reasons. We're supposed to be selecting the person who's going to be the leader of the country. Who's going to, um, who's basically going to, um, you know, execute the laws of the Constitution and, uh, you know, all this other right, stuff. Right, right, right. But that's not what most people vote for. They're voting for somebody who's going to, like, ultimately, I think the most simplistic way is to solve their problems, yeah. right? Like, like, oh, there's there's Mexicans coming over the border. I want somebody to solve my problem. There's, right. there's I, my grandmother is sick and we can't afford the health care bills. I want somebody to solve that problem. Someone to solve that, that yeah. Yes, yeah, so yeah. that's what people are asking. So, so do you think um do you think there's like some some um not necessarily an obligation but some responsibility in the campaign to actually find cuz like you say when you have when you when you bait them with the boot and you boot pill them and you have them in is there some responsibility to then take them and show them real solutions to solve those real problems that are out there well, it, there is, and, and that's what we are doing. And it's it's easy for us. It, there's, there's, there's also a, a greater responsibility for libertarians in general that the reality that when we bring people into libertarianism, that implicitly says, or actually explicitly says, that they're not libertarian. So whether we're bringing them in from the Republican Party or from the Green Party or the Democratic Socialist Party or the or the Democrats or just, you know, they were unaffiliated. The vast majority of them are going to be statists. Now, that doesn't mean we're just going to dump a bunch of people on you and say, here, now you deal with it. But what it does mean is that 
I mean, really, if they're not going to buy into our, our into our ideas, then the worst case scenario is they'll stick around and they'll vote for Vermin and maybe they'll vote for, you know, the, the ticket down ballot just because Vermin asked them to. And then they, you know, either weren't engaged or they didn't buy the ideas or whatever didn't happen. And, you know, they go back to voting however they voted before. They go back to not voting or whatever. Um, I don't think there's a risk of a bunch of people coming in and saying, we're going to now take over the Libertarian Party and make it the Medicare for all party. I think that w- what the risk is of, is of losing them. And so, yes, we've been doing that, you know, we've been doing that very, I think, very effectively. I think that there is a level of, of you have to be realistic in your expectations and what we can accomplish in a matter of months. Are we going to be able to boot pill all of them into strict doctrinaire libertarianism right off the bat within that period of time? No, at the very least right now, we can get their, them comfortable with libertarianism using vermin and using nonlinear messaging. And it's, it's something you've done with the, with the hat and with your messaging as well. But get people comfortable with libertarianism. Get them comfortable with the idea of libertarianism. Even if they aren't fully signed on to it, at least get them comfortable with libertarians, with what, what we even believe. And in doing that, we can, we can grow uh, uh, and, 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 and broaden and mature their perspective of libertarianism so that eventually they are libertarians to whatever you know, place on the spectrum of libertarianism they fall. You know, not all of them are going to turn into, you know, uh, ANCAPs and a- agorists like us. Some of them are going to become minarchists. Some of them are going to become kind of, you know, praggy, but they'll at least be, you know, they'll at least be libertarian. They'll at least believe in less coercion uh, n- later than they than they currently do now. And that happened from them finding a sympathetic character who made them even interested to find out about it in the first place. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think, um, I mean, that's really basic marketing 101, right? You get, right. Yes. You get like, um, like Fruit Loops. Do kids know they like Fruit Loops the first time they try them? No. Right. They they see like they see Toucan Sam on TV. Am I going back too far? Am I dating myself? I remember Fruit Loops. Yes, thank they you. They see they see Toucan Sam on the TV and they're like, oh, and he's telling me to eat the cereal. That's why they want it. But then they actually eat the cereal and then they get like, you know, then they get addicted. Right. Because <laughs> of all the drugs they put into it. But that's another story. But yeah, it's right. We, we want them to get addicted to the drugs that are libertarianism. It, yeah, exactly. Because um, we are a drug friendly society. But we need them to get to try the first one, which is free. Yeah. And how do you do much. that? You have a man on the boot with a trench coat full of all kinds of drugs, libertarian yeah. drugs, libertarian drugs, <laughs> libertarian drugs. Listen, and, and by the way, I've also done, you know, boot we pills, say vermin's kind of boot pills. It's boot pills. It's the boot pills. They're pills with little boots on them, but you have to consume the boot too. Can, can, I can you, I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but could you make like, I mean, little, little boot pills that look like little, I don't know, ecstasy tablets or something. We certainly could. I'm a little concerned about the liability of giving people something with a piece of leather on it for them to consume, but then saying, but don't, but don't consume it. And, and you go, well, it looks like a pill. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you know, it's a joke. Don't. I was just thinking smoke. like, like, you know, like Flintstones vitamins or something. Oh, like a Flintstone shaped pill filled with drugs with with like a Flintstone. Well, not with drugs, but like a like an actual like make it an actual vitamin. So you can actually give it to people and it's just a vitamin, oh. but it's shaped like a boot. It's like a vitamin pill. D3 supplement with a boot. Yeah. Save the world from coronavirus, too. <laughs> it could be all oh, it could be a, a hydroxychloroquine azithromycin pack <laughs> with a boot on it. And we say not only does this protect you from the flat earth and coronavirus, but also it's, it's got a little bit of falling off the flat earth <laughs> from call, you know, falling off the edge. You also won't get, you know, COVID uh, from the 5g towers. No, listen, I, I, so vermin is obviously the, the, uh, you know, 80% uh, satirical 20% serious candidate. I was supposed to be the 80% serious 20% satirical candidate. And at some point I just kind of became 50, 50. I didn't really keep with the mostly serious thing, but I have done serious uh, campaigning, empathetic campaigning to people that are historically left leaning. I've done uh, door knocking campaigns and housing projects in low income communities. And I've done uh, I've done campaigning on college campuses, handing out flyers, helping grow uh, college affiliates and, and talking with the with the, the voters, talking with the students there about what they what they think. I've done uh, Zoom. Vermin and I did Zoom calls with uh, 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 
college courses on, on, on Zoom, college classes, talking to the uh, faculty and the students there. And, and, and those were decidedly more serious conversations than, than, than we have in general. And what I have found uh, is that, for example, when I was in the, the low-income communities, uh, mostly, and again, these were mostly housing projects and then low-income communities that were near them. They were uh, in the Carolinas. They were primarily uh, black, probably 99 percent. There were maybe a handful of white people we came in between, uh, came uh, across, and, and some Hispanic people, but overwhelmingly black. Obviously, overwhelmingly poor because they were the poorer communities. And uh, in the housing projects, often libertarians will tell you that it's worthless going into those communities because they vote Democrat and they just want more government. No, they don't. Right. I talked to them. They were living as anarchists. I would show up in their homes and they were running the, you know, businesses under the table and doing business with people and doing favors for people under the table and running barter societies and, you know, letting people know when the police were coming through so that they, you know, everyone could, you know, put away whatever they were doing illegally when the police came through because they don't trust the police. Um, they were living as agorists. And yeah, they were doing it on state property because they had every their their actual means robbed from them a long time ago. So they're having to you know live on the crumbs of the state. But in, in order to try to live just a little bit better, they were living illegalist, prefigurative societies. And so going in there, I, I I had a feeling that our message would be well received. What I didn't know was that they'd be completing my sentences as I said them. When I would start talking about the war on drugs and how it was disproportionately harming them. And that, you know, there is no ju that, you know, we talk about justice, but there is no real justice. They were not only agreeing, but they were saying it at the same time or even before I was finishing saying it. And so we signed up a ton of people for the for the party. And more importantly, uh, we also changed the conversation in that in those communities, because up until then, they had no idea that there was no one out there who even cared about them at all. They didn't. Most of them had no idea that there was an actual word for what they believed. And they saw that it wasn't just them, you know, against the rest of the world, that there were people that actually wanted to build a society that would be more fair and equitable for all of us, including people like them. When I went to the college campuses, uh, I, I let them uh, direct the conversation because I honestly didn't know what they were going uh, to say. And I would, I would talk to them. I, I actually started it by asking them, I'd say, do you think you own yourself? Do you own yourself? And I'd let them take that wherever they wanted to take it. And I was surprised to see that almost all of them, probably well over 95% of them wanted to continue talking with me about it. And when the conversation would keep going, I would say, what is it that worries you the most right now? Almost all of them said student debt, or could they get a job once they got out of college? And I'd say, you know, well, what are you majoring in? And, and they'd tell me and I'd, I'd ask them, okay, well, why are you majoring in that? Almost all of them said the same thing, because I'm trying to get into my, you know, career choice, becoming a nurse, becoming a uh, you know, whatever it was, it's a liberal arts college, but you know, some of them were there before they would then go on to graduate school and everything from uh, want to be a social worker, want to be a teacher, want to be a doctor, want to be uh, an artist. Some people wanted to be uh, in communication. Some people wanted to run their own business, all these different things. And I would say, that's cool. Let me ask you this. What if you were able, instead of going to college to just intern and sit under people or apprentice under people who are already doing what you're doing? And you either didn't get paid anything or you get paid, you know, a, a small amount, you know, a stipend, but you didn't have to pay for it. You would just learn how to do it. And then once you reach within that in industry standard, whatever level of uh, master of mastering of that, that, you know, chosen field that you had gotten uh, by your peers deciding that you were now ready to do it, you now could go in and do it for a living. And they'd and probably in, in the same amount or less time than it would take to go to college and actually already have that experience doing it firsthand. And they all lit up and said, that's absolutely amazing, but I can't do that. And I said, okay, why can't you do that? And they say, because I need this degree. And I'd say, why do you need that degree? And if they got it, they would say, because the government says I has to, have to, because it's against the law not to. And then that was, a, that was an excellent opportunity for us to talk about the coercive nature of the state. How, a, how an arbitrary ruling by a bunch of politicians who had absolutely, in most cases, no knowledge or experience of their given choice of, of work were being influenced by rent-seeking lobbyists who wrote legislation for them requiring all of this you know, arbitrary occupational licensing, which required all of this arbitrary uh, higher education to be able to be allowed to do that work. And so we got a lot of people signed up for their their. Uh, campus affiliate based on that. And again, more importantly, we changed the trajectory. We actually moved the needle on the conversation on those campuses. Nice. Yeah. I mean, that's, um, 
That's awesome. Those are those are the types of conversations I like to see and the, the yeah. things I like to hear because that's that really is. Um, I mean, ultimately, you know, people like to say you can't change the system from the inside, but they haven't. In my opinion, they haven't really been trying because the what they think is the inside is really just the the byproduct, and right. that's the government, right? They, they oh, yep. if you treat if you get into the government. You can't fix it, but that's not the inside. That's not the thing we have to change. The thing that we have to change is the people. Exactly. Yep, the, the, mind, the mentality yep. of the entire country. Yep. Because that is what produces the government that we have. Those like when people say, I want this, I want this, I want this. And politicians are like, well, I got something else you want. I got, I'm going to come up with something else. And they just throw all this crazy crap at them. And they're like, oh, yeah, I'll take that. Like, oh, yeah, that'll solve my problem. Oh, shit. It made yep. things worse. OK, what else yep. you got? Like yep. if that's our mentality, then of course we're going to end up in this position, and it's, and it's going to keep getting worse. But if we change the mentality, um, then we can actually get a lot further. So the question is, how do we um, change people at a more massive scale, um, and and what's the path forward to that? Do you think that's something that's within the party, or do you think that's something that has to come from outside of the party? I think it can be both. I don't think it has to be both. It has to be one or the other specific to the conversation of how can the party do that? And really, it's a, it's a conversation about how can anyone do that? It's a bit of a truism. If you want to be able to talk to a lot of people, you have to be able to talk to a lot of people. And that's another big reason why I'm supporting why I'm supporting Vermin, why I why I came into this race to to promote Vermin as our candidate is because he has a unique ability uh, because of the persona he has built. Which is again, let's let's face it. He is presenting himself as a a satirical character. He is presenting as a vermin supreme. Vermin supreme, yes, is an actual human being, and he has those. I mean, you've you've been there. He takes the boot off. He has serious conversations. He is an actual human being. He is presenting himself as a persona that has become incredibly popular, well outside of of, of libertarian or even political circles. People enjoy his 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 fantasy that he presents to them it's almost like watching professional wrestling or or any other thing where we know what we're watching is is a there's a level of satire and and fantasy and make believe and it's a welcome respite from the realities of the real world so he presents that opportunity by by growing growing the potential audience and the thing is i would rather have because there are a lot of people that will say okay great you're growing the audience but what if mo what if most of them reject it okay great i would much rather have 20% of an audience of 10 million people buy into what I have to say, then have 80% of an audience of 10,000 buy into it or 100,000 buy into it. Do the numbers on that. The right. vast majority of people or a much larger number of people will have bought into it in that first scenario, even though a smaller percentage bought into it. And if we did it in a humorous and empathetic way, even the ones who didn't buy into it are probably not going to come away with a negative experience and, and, and disliking us. They're just going to say, yeah, I don't, I don't really buy into that. I, I don't like the humor or, or, you know, I, I like the humor, but the message and eh, I could take it or leave it, but you didn't put a bad taste in their mouth. They just weren't happy. They just, you know, you didn't boot pill them in that moment, but there's opportunities in the future. At the very least you didn't offend them. So I would much rather take that. And I, that's why I'm grateful that Vermin is lending his credibility to, to our party and our platform. Um, and I, I think that it's an absolutely terrific thing. You, you have to get in front of people. Once you get in front of people, you have to be able to actually articulate that message to the people. And that's where we all come in. Vermin's doing his part. I'm doing my part. You're doing your part. We have to do that. When people come in and go, hmm, what's libertarianism all about? Let's present it. Let's pretend for a moment. I don't know if you've always been libertarian. I have not. I used to be a neocon. I used to be a, a and then I became, you know, over time, I kind of moved my way out of authoritarianism from neocon to constitutionalist to paleocon, minarchist to libertarian, praggy type to, you know, uh, you know, eventually to, to, you know, anarchist. And we have to talk to people like we're talking to ourselves back when we were still conditioned to mm -hmm. believe that there is real and, and legitimate authority in government figures and in the and, and 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 not just in those government figures, but in the the rent seeking people in power, so-called private actors who are really just extensions of the state that we pretend are people that we should be listening to because of their presumed authority and cachet. And and why do we think that? Let's examine why we think that. 
when we're little kids, we're told that if we get lost, hug a tree and and and, and yell for a police officer. If so, if a stranger comes, here's what we're told: if a stranger comes up to you, say no, I don't talk to strangers. Run away and look for what a police officer. What is a police officer but an armed stranger who has a badge and the presumed authority to do whatever to you he wants? Uh, within some structure of, of, of legal limitations that ultimately the people who are part of the same organization of, of enforcement that he is will close ranks around him if he gets too if he gets so bad that he actually breaks the law, which is hard enough for them to do. Uh, but if they actually break the law, they'll close ranks around each other. Get away from that stranger and go find that other stranger who actually, if he did something to you, the law would would protect him as much as possible. We are conditioned to this at a very, very early age. We are conditioned that, you know, our, our, our people in office are people that we should listen to. Look at how the people who are so mad at Trump, why are they mad at Trump? They're mad at Trump for the thing we find hilarious, that he's, he's denigrating the office with the way that he acts. He's, he's destroying the concept of what it means to be presidential. And that's true. He's still being a sociopathic, uh, racist, rapist, murderer like everyone before him. He's just not acting respectable while he does it. He's not, he's not doing it in a nice, smooth way that makes us feel good about ourselves. But he's doing the same thing that all of them are. Right. So you know, that's why we're conditioned to believe this stuff. And so you know, it, it's important for us to decondition people. But you have to decondition, decondition people in a way that doesn't push them away before you can fully do it. Interesting. Um, I had a question like three minutes ago, and it's just... <laughs> But I just kept talking. Yeah, and I if didn't want to stop just... you because um, that's that's good stuff. It is. Um, um, yeah, we, we we've definitely got a lot of common ground there. Um, of course. So, oh man, so many so many different ways I can go. Um, because I know you know you're talking about doing things outside of the party, inside of the party, and of course there's. Um, in my opinion, there's a lot of resistance inside of the party for any type of of real productive action. Um, oh, yeah. I, I think yeah. there's and I, I get it. I mean, you know, it's it's at the same time you have. It's weird, right? The party is like it's a bunch of people who who hate the government and want to either get rid of it or at least reduce it. Right. But they've created this other system where we're going to sit around and argue about rules as if we're creating another government. Mm -hmm. um, and and then that prevent, prevents us from actually getting out and, and um, being proactive and working on educating people and changing things. And I get I get the idea that. Like the so okay, I mean, there's you know the, the Libertarian Party isn't the only place where you can go to learn liberty, right? There's a million other organizations. Of course, of course, yeah. But the libert I get that the Libertarian Party is supposed to be like, okay, if you want to run for office and make a change that way, then this is the place to do it. it what it but, also is is a, and I I've seen this firsthand. When I would go and knock on people's doors or talk to them in colleges and I would say, hey, I'm Spike Cohen and I'm running for vice president, that immediately got their attention. And they go, vice president of what? I'd say, of the United States of America. Right. And they go, and you you're- can do that? What? And you're talking to me? And, and that, because of their conditioning, that this is this right. hallowed prize, when the reality is I'm just some schmuck, right? I'm just some schmuck who's saying I'm running for vice president. And I am. I mean, I'm legitimately running for vice president. Anyone can run for vice president. But the fact that I said I was doing it made people go, oh, man, maybe I should listen to what he has to say. Not everyone, but it gave a, a, enough people gave a certain level of, 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 of cachet and reverence to the idea of what I was doing that they would take a second look. Or, or they'd say, man, this guy's running for vice president, and he's even interested in what I have to say and in talking to me. They've it's almost, given it's a level like you're of, wearing some sort of a shiny badge. Like I'm wearing some sort of shiny badge. Right. And I'm literally just a schmuck who says I'm running for vice president. That's And yet just doing that gave me a level of reverence because of the conditioning. So a political party is an attempt to leverage, whether for good or ill, that conditioning that people have about the state and our relation with it. So if we say we are, if we don't say, it's one thing to say, hey, we're a club that likes liberty and we want you to believe in liberty too. That'll attract some people if we message it well. 
But if you say we're a political party and we're going to get in charge of government so that we can do amazing things for you. And the things that we want to do in government are liberty. That gets a lot more people's attention. The problem is what happens when you are a political party. For example, we often talk about getting 5%. We got to get 5%. Well, this candidate, this candidate's all libertarian and all, and that's great. But will he get us 5%? Right. What the hell happens at 5%? You know the answer to this, but some of the people watching probably don't. What happens at 5%? We still In my lose. opinion, absolutely nothing. Well, so here's, but here's the thing. In terms of the actual count, nothing happens. 5% is no more magical than 4% or 6%. 5% would be awesome in a 21-way race. In a competitive 21-way race, 5% might win it for us. We aren't in that. So five, what is 5%? At 5%, the Libertarian Party can start applying for – they get what's called minor party status, which allows them to apply for – drumroll, please. Stolen money. Money. Matching it's not it's not 50 50 matching because it's based on a percentage of your vote or whatever but but up to 50% matching federal funding for your next presidential campaign care of the tax and now all of a sudden it makes sense why there are some in the libertarian party who don't want to say that taxation is theft turns out that to them taxation is a great way to fund a political campaign yeah now let me ask you this why would people who have if people who have no power are already primarily concerned about reserving federal funding, stolen money, for their political purposes, what in the hell makes you think that if they actually get into power, that they're not going to just keep trying to get more of that money for political purposes? Right. Yeah, they and are, I mean, this is... That's all they're going to do. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, I, I was just saying, that's all they're going to do. Um, yeah, and th this is kind of my, my issue with... Um, you know, I was thinking, I was thinking like Amash, like, okay, so, so let's say he jumps in, right? And right. I don't really know him because I don't, I don't, you know, I don't follow too much of what he does. He's never really been on my radar, but I hear, you know, he's pretty libertarian. But I'm thinking, okay, he's been elected. I don't know if he's tried to submit a bill to repeal Obamacare or, um, or the Patriot Act or anything else. Has he? I don't know. Probably not. I don't know if anybody's ever submitted any. He of has that. voted against, like for example, extending right, you know, so the Trade Act and surveillance and and, okay. and stuff like I that. Guess that's... But, he does, he does, but he does. Here's an important thing: he does so on constitutional grounds, not libertarian grounds, and that's right. a completely different monster. Yes, but now here's the other thing, right? Um, does he believe that taxation is theft? I would say no, because he, unlike some other people, is taking. Uh, his congressional, like even Ron Paul took, I think he took half of his congressional salary. Something like that. And um, as far as I know, Amash has taken the whole thing, which is stolen from other people, um, including his constituents, who's, who he's supposed to be protecting. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I look at that and I, I can find several objections. But back to your point about the 5%, it, it is really interesting because a lot of people believe if we get the right guy in the right suit who looks just like every other politician, we become somehow credible yep. and more people are going to want to vote for us. Yes. Yeah. If they, if they see, if all they know about you is, you know, a guy smiling in a suit with a name next to it, 2020, and that's all they know, then yeah, but that's not going to create any new libertarians anyway. And only if you're one of the major parties that has a chance of winning, listen, and a billion dollars to back it up. And you got a ton of money to back it up. Or you're already a celebrity. So like in the example of uh, uh, Jesse Ventura running for uh, uh, governor of, of Minnesota, he was beloved in Minnesota. He's the most famous Minnesotan. So he was able, and he had money behind him and he was able to do that. But in most circumstances- But he, a, wasn't, he, wasn't, he wasn't just another suit with a fake politician. No, he exactly. So he even even he was was breaking that that mold that we're supposed to be respectable. If respectability and pragmatism, can we stop calling it pragmatism? You can't call something pragmatism if it never works. That's just scared politics. That's fear based politics. That is saying, you know what? I'm going to run using all of the precepts that the that the Republicans that the Republicans and Democrats have set forward, and I'm going to give instant credibility to everything they've said about me by playing scared pool right off the back, thereby making sure that they've already won the moral battle, which was the one thing that I had any hope to win. 
to try to to try to do well in the election. I'm already ceding that to them right off the beginning before anyone even knows who I am. And let's let's be clear about what a third party campaign is in most cases, especially at the statewide and federal level. It is an invitation for people to vote for a party and a candidate who is likely to lose. So if you are presenting yourself as sort of a, a half measure different from the Republicans and the Democrats, the, the best parts of the Republicans and the Democrats are fiscally conservative and socially liberal. We're, we're like the better. We're like the other parties, except just marginally better. If you do that, then here is the option. You are giving two options, two choices to voters. Choice number one is what they usually vote for, which is a party, one of the major parties, Republicans or Democrats, that don't really represent them and they don't really trust them, but they have a good chance of winning. Choice number two is you, a third party person who they just heard of, who sounds like you're a little bit better than those other parties, but you have absolutely no chance of winning or very, very little chance of winning. And that is how you end up getting one two, maybe three, what is it? 3.25% right. that, uh, that Gary and, and Bill or got. Somebody who's th- th- a third party who's absolutely batshit crazy or completely different from what they're used to. Because, because that's the thing, right? Like th- this is why, I mean, this is, this is so obvious to me and I don't know why the others don't get it. People are sick. They already talk about, they always talk about the disenfranchised voters they're sick of Republicans. They're sick of Democrats. They hate Trump. They hate Hillary. They hate Bernie Sanders. Right, they hate Joe right, Biden. They right. hate all of them. So yep. let's find a libertarian who looks just like them. Thank you. What? Let's let's reinforce what a politician make? should. Let's let's reinforce the 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 Republican and Democrat narrative of what a politician should look like by presenting by by being for the 49th year in a row the Charlie Brown to their Lucy with the football, that if we dress the right way and talk the right way and put up the respectable candidate, that this time they're going to let us kick that football. They're going to let us have a place at the table. They're not going to let us have a place at the table. And it's not even because of our ideas, because they know that if we continue to run the way that we're running, that we'll end up becoming just like them. They know that. There's a bunch of idealists in government who started as idealists and ended up becoming the same cynical thieving murderous monsters that they that they sought to replace right. they know that we'll become just like them if we use the same strategy they're not, they're not buying gonna, it we got to use not, force they don't hate us for our freedoms the reason they're keeping us off the table is because they don't want to share it's a much more base reason they just don't want to share their stuff with us and so of course it's never going to work we have to completely subvert their system because the because one of two things is going to happen if we keep playing it their way and keep worrying about matching funds and getting federal money for this and and all of that stuff either we're never going to get a shot at the table or we are but only after we become exactly like them and and i guarantee you if if our primary concern is getting stolen money for our political purposes that's never going to end the more of that money we get we're already hungry for that money we've never gotten any of it what happens when we get it then we're really going to get hungry for it and we're really going to want it i i see these guys like Okay, so so they're trying to figure out like what's what's the plan for for the National Libertarian Convention, right? Right. And they came up with a few different ideas and they're like, "Yeah, but it's not legal." Aren't we supposed to be the party that says fuck the law, we'll figure out a loophole, we'll figure out a way around it? I mean, they're talking about we can't have an electronic convention. Okay. Well, what if we send one person from every state? We have an online electronic convention that's not binding according to the law, but we right. make each delegate sign a contract saying that they're going to deliver those exact vote totals. And then we can actually implement something that's like a digital electronic direct democracy to pick a person, which right. of course is not the type of democracy that's going to say, okay, we're going to use force against everybody because everybody right. involved is already there voluntarily. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Like what, like, these are the types of like ideas and systems that should be coming out. And instead, everybody's just like, well, we have to follow the law. Holy shit. Did you know you don't even need to file with the FEC if you're running? Like, you don't even need to file with the FEC. That's just so they can monitor what money you're raising and all kinds of other bullshit. But right. If you're yeah, yeah. But if you want to be included and, and that you can still raise money and not file with the FEC. But if you want to be included in the libertarian debates. Oh, you better have an FEC report. 
Oh, I was at the I was at the Tennessee convention, and there was an absolute uproar over. I don't even remember what it was. It was it was a it was a bylaw, but uh, it, it was some bylaw change, and I don't even remember what it was. And, and this that's not the important part. The important part was that it referenced com- compliance with federal wage and labor laws. It had something to do with hiring someone to do something, and it said something uh, 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 keeping in compliance with federal wage and labor laws. And there was an absolute, uh, and it was and it was led by Tom Arnold. Was a total revolt on the floor against it. And Tom Arnold came up and said, you know, uh, you know, what are we doing referencing federal law in how we do stuff? Let's, if, if, if it's to be fair to the worker or whatever it was, let's just write it up in such a way that it's fair to them. Why are we, why do we, let's go above and beyond what the, the federal minimum is. And the, the persons, they said, uh, uh, well, we just copy pasted it from whatever other state affiliate. The, let's, I, I don't remember the state. It sounded but state. good because it had the word federal in there. Right, exactly. It, well, and it was from another libertarian state party. And Tom Arnold said, "Well, I'm sorry that whatever state that is is filled with a bunch of statists." But uh, you know, I wish I had a good Tom Arnold impersonation. But he said, "You know, I'm sorry they're filled with a bunch of statists." But here in Tennessee, we're not going to put up with such a thing. And then someone else said, "Well, you know, this is just to to make sure that we don't break the law." And he's like, "Well, fuck the law. Let's just you know, let's let's if if the point is to be fair to the worker, then let's make sure it's fair to the worker." But you know. Forget this garbage about complying with federal law. The problem is there are people within the Libertarian Party, uh, and, and this isn't about individual people. This is just a prevailing mindset that is both inside and outside of the, the liberty, liberty movement, which is that I'm fine with freedom as long as it's done legally. And the problem with that is that you're fine with freedom as long as it's done legally because the legal system has left you largely comfortable. And I'm not talking about you, but I'm saying the person that believes this. It's left you largely comfortable. So you're okay with the legal process as it stands because you're able to be as free as mostly as free as you'd want to be. Maybe not quite as free as you'd like to be, but you're fine with working within the legal confines. If you were in a different situation where now suddenly the legal process is what is trying to get you deported or killed or put in a cage now suddenly the legal process isn't as important. So it is definitely speaking from a position of privilege, but it's also speaking from a position of, of uh, conditioning that you know we should be doing stuff based on whether it's legal or not. Even people within the liberty movement saying that what is important is that we comply with the law. No, what's important is that we comply with our principles. And our principles being that you own yourself, you own your life, you own your body, you own your labor, and you own your property, and no one should be able to take those things from you without your explicit non-coerced consent and that if anything violating that including government including the actions of government are simply unfit to exist and that we should be stamping in those things out abolishing them and dismantling them we've got a we've got a side discussion going on in the comments over whether i saw this i saw this theft or extortion yes Um, yeah so so legally and i've had this brought to my attention that you know taxation isn't theft because you know, legally, theft is a legal term. Okay, then taxation is someone taking from you against your will under the under the explicit threat of whatever level of harm is required to bring you into compliance. Okay, I got into it with some lawyers. So okay, so this is how this is how it went down. I was trying to get a billboard that said taxation is theft. And the billboards are, are owned by private owners, but it goes through a broker firm. That they're like the digital billboards, right? So it's like a, right. it's like a broker that they have their own rules and they have a contract so that basically they don't have to go to the owner of the sign to determine whether or not they can show something. They have their own set of rules of what they can approve, what they can't approve. Right, right, right. They refused uh, taxation as theft because it's negative campaigning. And I was like, okay, well, hmm, what can we do? And um, someone on my team came up with the idea, what if instead of saying taxation is theft, we said, do you believe taxation is theft? Or libertarians believe taxation is theft. Now it's no longer negative, it's stating a fact. Well, it's declarative, right? It was already a fact, but yeah. So um, it was saying something about somebody who has no objection to that. So he sent that to them. And they still rejected it. And and we were like, what the hell's going on? And they sent it to their lawyers and they got their lawyers involved. 
And their lawyers said, we can't have anything related to taxation as theft because it's not factually true. Because the government gets to decide what is and isn't theft. Right. This was a lawyer. This is somebody who paid I don't know how many thousands of dollars, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands to go to a law school to get a degree yep. to study and pass the bar exam to say that they have no idea what theft is. Only the government. <laughs> Only can the decide. government explains. Here's what I have to say to the people who say this thing. First of all, Okay, great. Let's pr let's just take them at their word. Okay, then let's just call taxation, you know, violent removal of property from people against their will under the threat of of harm. Like that makes it better. But but let's let's examine this for a second. When because the the idea is that you know th that theft isn't some kind of common nomenclature about forcible taking. Theft is a legal term. Okay, great. So that means that if you are walking down the street and you see someone taking something from someone you first make sure that they don't have legal approval do a, to do, do it. Badge? Excuse me, do you have a badge? <laughs> May I see your, your warrant to take this person's property before I determine, before I yell stop thief uh, at the top of my lungs? Let me just make sure that you have your, your, your papers in, in, in order. And unfortunately, there are some people who, yeah, that's probably how they would think. I mean, but no, think that, about it. If, if, a woman, if a woman yells, stop, he's got my purse, People will go run after him if they don't pull out their camera just to, to just record it instead. And I've seen right. it. Some people was it one pull, one person pulls out their camera and somebody else runs after him and stops runs the after guy. them. Right. But if that person is a cop, holy shit! I mean, imagine like I saw a woman get abducted the other day. Yeah. By a guy who was wearing a uniform and a badge, and he also a had a gun, and, yeah. and he was scary. Yeah. Authority a, cosplay. A mother. Listen, why? Because they were at the park and they weren't supposed to be there. Even yep. though they paid for the park, they supposedly own the park because they've been paying for it as a taxpayer. With your, because they've been steal robbing you to 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 yeah. in part to finance that. Yeah. yeah, and that's the problem. And, and and again, if we even agree with their, if we say okay, fine, theft is purely a legal term. There's no moral moral uh, uh, aspect to the question of whether or not taxation is theft. Let's just, we'll just pretend that for a moment. It's just purely a legal term. It didn't exist. Theft did not exist until we had a, a, a system of, of, of uh, a common system of law, uh, you know, the, the Anglo-Saxon legal system. Until that happened, there was no such thing as theft. We'll pretend that for a moment. Okay, great. Then we'll just call it forcible taking uh, under threat of harm. You know, I mean, like, like as though that makes it better. So it feels like a little bit of a dunk on people to go, well, you know, technically it's not theft. Okay, great. Technically right. it's not theft. Like, I'll, I'll even agree with you. Technically, let's just pretend it's technically not theft. Did that make it okay? Like, is that we're, right. we're, we're cool now because because it met a legal definition of, of, of what's okay? It, it's crazy to me. Well, well, it's like how they'll say that war is not murder because murder is, you know, legally justified. Okay, great. Um, well, this then, is the thing. Like, our, our brains work associatively, right? So like if you if you um, like you can look at things and you can say this is good, this is bad, this fits under this definition, this doesn't. And right. so when when you're conditioned to believe that anything that a person in the uniform does is superior to everything that you do, because, right, if something happens, you call the police officer who, who right. comes from the law, which is even further above. They create the police officer and he, he descends comes down, down from the law to yeah. sort yeah. to sort things out like that's yeah. that's kind of the hierarchy that people have in their heads. Right. When you have a mm -hmm. problem, you go to the police. If they can't solve it, you go to the courts. If they can't solve it, you go to, you know, Congress or, you know, whatever. Um, but a lot of these arguments are just over over words and definitions. Right. Oh, yeah. So so yeah. like are like ask somebody who's pro choice if they believe in murder. And they'll say no. And so so why do you believe in abortion? Because I don't believe that's murder. You're just right. arguing the definition. Well, some people say right. it is. Well, that person doesn't have the right to define it. I do. Because my definition is... Aha, aha. And so, so now, suddenly, yep, yep, suddenly. And that's what that whole, that's what that whole fight uh -huh. is about. I say that is murder. I say it's not murder. Yep. And and you and you have this whole debate. And so, but it's, it's the same thing with police. It's the same thing with government. And... It's all it's all conditioning, right? Because we've see we see it in movies, we see it in TV, yep. we see it in in schools, in education, we see yep. it all day through, like you know, the government training and like 
shit. All everything that's on the news and telling us like, oh yes, the the anchor man who's not is is blah 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 is telling us to obey the police officers and wear your mask and stay six feet apart. Like all this, like this is all conditioning. They must be smart. Ooh, this doctor's standing right next to the president. He must be the smartest doctor in the entire country. The smartest, the chief doctor. Yes. Right. But now he here's what's possibly really interesting. not know anything. Yeah. Yep. Because our brains work associatively. This goes right back to what I, what what we were talking about about libertarians picking a guy who looks just like a politician because yep. as soon as you stick him in government well he's just another piece of the he's government just another politician he's just doing the same thing that everybody else is doing you and need more, it, something that's visually different that speaks different and that's how trump won because people were sick of politicians he doesn't dress the same he doesn't look the same he doesn't talk the same He's an asshole. Obviously, he's going to be in there. He's going to be like a like a bull in a china shop, and he's yep. not a politician. Now, of course, it didn't work out that great because he's also an asshole. But well, and, and he has no problem doing what the people before him did. I, every time someone says to me, you know, America's not ready to vote for, you know, someone with a with a boot on his head who's talking about ponies, I say America elected a bright orange man who speaks at a low scream and gold plates everything. Someone who has been the butt of pop culture jokes for 40 years now. He hasn't been the comedian. He's been the he's been the punchline even worse. He's even worse than the comedian. He's the thing people are laughing at and making jokes about. And he won because he got people's attention. He pretended to care about what they think and he gave policy prescriptions that were wildly different or sounded wildly different from what everyone else was proposing and look what happened he won now now that he's won turns out he's just like the rest of them it, it with one major exception is the aesthetics and the and the and the messaging and so forth but largely he is every other politician that came before before him it's like uh i forget who said it but you know no matter who you vote for you get john mccain but at the end of the day he proves our proof of concept that that you can you can do way better than anyone expected and, and Jesse Ventura did the same. Vermin Supreme being as popular as he is by trolling the New Hampshire primaries once every four years is the proof of concept that you can become, you can get people's attention. You can burst them out of that conditioning and the, and the, and the, and the, the heavily edited and, and, and processed sound bites that we call news from corporate media with nonlinear messaging, with something that snaps them into attention and, and snaps them out of this, this, you know, cloud of farce that they're in into something that obviously doesn't fit and obviously needs to be paid attention to. I had reporters come here, sat right over there interviewing me for, for, for an article, what they thought was going to be an article about a local guy who's running for vice president. What's that all about? And I talked to them for about a half hour in sound bites, actually probably close to an hour in nothing but sound bites about ponies and badgers and cheesy bread and legalizing uh, legalizing recreational plutonium and uh, and putting arming ponies with 20 millimeter cannons and impeaching the whole Supreme Court and appointing the janitor and the janitor's name is Reggie and he's going to rule over us as king like I wouldn't stop and they would say what is this that you're doing? And I'd say, well, I'll tell you what I'm doing. And I'd, I'd start talking about requiring police officers to sing the Barney theme song when they arrest people and have to dress up like Barney and say, hey, stop right there. And, and if they, if at any point they don't keep character and, and the, the, the perp or the person that they are you know, trying, attempting to arrest or cite or investigate says, Hey, officer, you're not keeping with the, with the Barney, the, the Barney character. I'm not feeling it. That officer has to let them go without arrest or citation, uh, which is a powerful civil, civil liberties tool. I did this for, for an hour. Do you know why I did it? Because I got thousands of shares. They gave me essentially a two minute long unopposed. They didn't even look for because they originally said they were going to look for someone to oppose my message. Whatever I said, they were going to look for someone to counter it because they never just present one person's message by itself when they're a politician and running for office. And they, they couldn't find someone who was they like, yeah, not this whole plan of singing the Barney song is ridiculous. It's a waste of taxpayer money. <laughs> the worst they could find was someone who gave a 10 second it was a professor a local call a local a professor of econo uh, politics who said well you know 30 party candidates have a a, a a very um crucial role in our politics but people tend to then return back to the two parties that's all they could get the entire thing was just me bullshitting them about satire and that that article and that news piece got something like 7,000 shares. Now, how many more, how many shares do you think it would have gotten if I had sat there and said, you know, we believe you own yourself and we want to end the wars? My family would have shared it. My friends would have shared it. It might have gotten a 
200 shares, mostly from people who already knew me. Maybe. It got thousands of shares because people said, what the fuck was this? What did I just watch? And we got a ton of traffic on the website and our social media saying, what did I just watch? Ponies, badgers? And we got a lot of those people. Some of those people joined the team. We got people who had no idea what the hell they just watched on the 11 o'clock news who got, well, first the 7 o'clock and then the 11 o'clock news, got home from work and said, what did I just watch? And had to find out more. I subverted their system. Instead of doing what they wanted me to do and talk about taxation and talk about, which again, these are all solid things, but start by talking about serious, dour subjects and present myself in a respectable way and wear a nice suit. And I, again, I'm not like vermin. I don't wear 12 ties and, and, and a boot. I, it's not my aesthetic. I, I, I dress like this or I'll even wear a suit. Like, like you know, you wear, you wear a suit and I'll, I'll or I'll, I, for that, I wore like a nice sweater with a, with a vermin pin. And I put my, my, my stuff narwhal here with prominence and we were never at any point explained what this was and just, you know, just had it here. Like it was an important thing. And like, you know, I did this whole thing. And they, they gave me basically an unopposed news item and had people wonder what the hell they just watched. And I did that by not doing what they wanted me to do, not being Charlie Brown to their Lucy, not playing their game, subverting, leveraging their system and subverting it for our ends instead of the opposite. And that's what we need to do. I'm not saying every single person needs to be silly and talk about ponies and badgers and whatever else. What I'm saying, cheesy bread, uh, what I'm saying is that if you have that in you, if you have that humor in you, embrace it and be that thing. Whatever you do, be different. Break the mold from what the Republicrats have been doing for well over 100 years now. Don't just be a difference in departure in principle. Be a difference in departure from messaging because their system isn't designed for that. Their system is designed for them and people who act like them and shutting out people who try to act like them but not within their party. Let's be something completely different that they can't ignore, that the public can't ignore, and that they can't have effective counter messaging to because we're acting like clowns. Absolutely. All right. Well, um, that's uh, that's the show. <laughs> um, Best outro ever. Yeah. Uh, go ahead and uh, give your give yourself a plug. Give your um, your website we got your website on the screen well we've got one of your websites on the screen fb.com that's actually facebook.com for those of you who don't know but you can use fb.com by the way really yeah you can Shit. use fb.com yeah no that's a legit that's a legit thing fb.com i've been typing it out home. the whole time how much yeah. did they pay for that so that you could save 13 seconds while you're typing that url they probably paid like 12 million dollars for it the free market works yeah <laughs> so, and somebody but, so, was like fuck you zucker that they bought fb.com yeah. yeah well they have fb.me too but it turns out fb.com works yeah futures yeah. now man um so yeah if you want to find out more about me uh, and about what i'm doing uh, my website is spike 2020.com you can find out more about my 10 point plan my my verbal agreement for an even better america uh and if you reach out to me we can actually talk about serious stuff too uh if you want to follow me on social media my twitter is at real spike cohen uh my facebook you can go to uh, fb.com slash literally Spike Cohen, or if you're searching in the Facebook bar, it's Spike Cohen, your next VP. Uh, if you want to find out more about Vermin, Vermin Supreme 2020, uh, Vermin Supreme is all over social media. It won't be hard to find him. Uh, if you want to find out more about my shows, My Fellow Americans and Muddy Waters of Freedom, you can go to muddiedwatersmedia.com or Muddy Waters Media. We are on all social media. If you look for Muddied Waters, you will you will absolutely find us. Uh, and, and again, and be sure to check out Dan. Guys like... You know, I'm I'm supporting Vermin, but Dan is Dan's up there too. Like, I if, if Dan's our nominee, I am 100% behind him. And I'm not just saying that because I want him to pick me for his VP. But I'm not not saying it for that reason. But no, I, I I Dan's a great guy. Dan's messaging is incredible. He gets it. He gets what we're trying to do. He gets the idea of the of the the nonlinear messaging and 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 coming at people in a different angle so that they can get it. So be sure to if you're if 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 you came over here, you know, be sure to find out more about Dan as well. Uh, all of us, we're all great people. Find out about us, but yeah, spike2020.com at real spike Cohen, spike Cohen, your next VP. Nice, thanks, man. Thank that you. that made me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. Yeah, so you know, literally, when you're looking for your VP. All right, yeah. um, <laughs> and uh, I I want to put in a plug too. Um, we we have an awesome event coming up. I don't know if you saw it yet. 
Um, taxation is theft fest 2020 yes. taxation is theft fest.com. You can go and, um, all we have up there right now is a logo, but it's coming soon. And actually there's an event. If you go to, if you go to facebook.com, you're probably on it already, but facebook.com slash taxation is theft two number two, cause we're number two. Um, <laughs> there's an event. <laughs> There's an event on that page um, where you can uh, you can follow to get updates. Um, but this is going to be an awesome thing. It's going to be a full weekend long. It is the convention that everybody wants to go to but can't because of either coronaphobia or a tyrant in some office making you stay in your home. So it's going to be awesome. Um, it's all going to be live stream on YouTube. Hopefully, we're going to have two channels going simultaneously so you can flip back and forth and there's going to be some awesome talks and everything. So go check that out. And of course, taxation is theft. Spike, thank you again for literally being here. There, here. I'll see you next time. For being in my own home. Thank you. Yes. I'm glad I could. I'm glad I could be in my own home. Thank, thank you. you for merging merging your video stream with mine. Oh, I'm so, I was so excited too. Thank you. <laughs> Taxation is theft. Please, at least leave us alone in our living room. My job is to find the truth. Double the taxes. I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. Triple the taxes. This is an IRS agent's dream. If you think that the capital will ever treat us fairly, you are lying to yourself. Beautiful, lovely taxes. Uh -oh. <laughs> Sorry, but I don't do taxes. Did you see the memo about this? The government is a greedy piglet. Just leave us alone. Do you know what Ralph just said? The roads. <laughs> you boys like me.